Now hear the word of the Lord from 1 Kings 13, 1 through 10. At the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel, arriving there just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into this dynasty, into the dynasty of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign to prove his message. He said, the Lord has promised to give you this sign. This altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out onto the ground. When King Jeroboam heard the man of God speaking against the altar at Bethel, he pointed at him and shouted, seize that man. But instantly the king's hand became paralyzed in that position and he could not pull it back. At the same time, a wide crack appeared in the altar and the ashes poured out just as the man of God had predicted in his message from the Lord. The king cried out to the man of God, please ask the Lord your God to restore my hand again. So the man of God prayed to the Lord and the king's hand was restored and he could move it again. Then the king said to the man of God, come to the palace with me and have something to eat and I will give you a gift. But the man of God said to the king, even if you gave me half of everything you own, I would not go with you. I would not eat or drink anything in this place. For the Lord gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you are there and do not return to Judah by the same way that you came. So he left Bethel and went home another way. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. You may be seated. Good morning, Sojourn. Peace be with you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Uh, welcome if you're a guest or, uh, or if you're visiting with us. My name's Jonah, and I'm one of the pastors here at Sojourn. Uh, our mission as a church is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of who he is and what Jesus has done for us, and then to build one another up as his church and send each other to follow him as instruments of truth, beauty, and goodness. So reach, build, send, that's our mission. We spent a lot of time talking about this uh, over the weekend with our orientation class. That's kind of our new member experience. Uh, our gold star participant, Savannah, was there. Savannah, congratulations. You were the gold star at the new member class. Yep, yep. That's not a thing. She just did great, and I told her I would say in front of everybody if she came. I bribed her with church attendance. Um, but, but in there, you know, when you see our mission, this happened in the orientation class, when we say reach, build, send, the build part is usually the ones that uh, people in our tradition, the more evangelical types are like, what does that mean? Are we all about building campaigns? Are we gonna expand the facility? And so can we do a little crowd participation to show you what I mean? I, this is a trick, I'm going to trick you all, but just go with it. Um, so by show of hands or amen, who would agree God is in control? Amen. Leave your hand up. Don't put it down yet. Um, uh, leave your hand up if you've struggled to fall asleep in the last two months. Okay, put your hand up. Okay. Okay. So what do we mean build? All of you or most of you um, raised your hand and said God was in control. All or most of you left your hand up when you said you struggled to fall asleep. But listen, let me remind you, God is in control. And if God's in control, you should fall asleep. So just go back, go fall asleep. You know? Uh, husbands, uh, in 1 Peter 3, uh, it says that if you're mean or harsh with your wife, God won't listen to you pray. Did you know that? So stop being mean to your wife. How does that go, right? Um, so sometimes we call this the head-heart disconnect. I believe God is in control. Uh, do you know, Dad, it says don't, get, don't make your kids angry. Don't exasperate your kids. Uh, they'll run away from you. So stop making your kids angry. Did you know Jesus said to pray for your enemies? Did you know it's better to give money away than to hoard it? Like, listen, if you want to understand Christianity, I can give you the answers in like eight minutes. It's just really not that complicated, the stuff, the do's and the don'ts. Uh, but the problem is so few of us actually live that way. Amen? We believe God is in control, uh, but we live anxious and scared lives. So there's a difference between what we confess and what we possess in terms of our faith. So when we say build one another up as the church, we want to bridge that gap to where what we believe is actually how we live. Uh, we believe Christianity is more than an idea here. 
We believe Christianity is a person, and that person, Jesus, invites us into a real relationship with him that's transformative, that's experiential. And so uh, a couple of times a year, we haven't done this particular class in about four years, four or five years, I think. Uh, we use a personality profile tool in our church called the Enneagram, which is intended to help each one of us understand what's below the surface. Why am I so anxious, even though I have the answer that God is in control? It's meant to help us understand who we are more clearly, that we might come to Jesus and one another more fully. So it's a tool that we found to be incredibly helpful for bridging that head-heart disconnect. Uh, it's easy to get the answers. It's much harder to experience that kind of soul level transformation that the Lord's inviting us to. So if that's like the least bit interested, interesting to you, if you feel a little bit stuck in your faith journey or like it's not working, um, I really strongly encourage you to come check this out. Uh, it's September 30th, it begins, and we're running the same class. It's a four week class, but we're running it twice in a row. So the idea is it's a co-ed class, and we wanted, if you've got little ones at home, we wanted an opportunity where a husband and a wife could go together or have a similar experience. So the wife can go the first four weeks while dad stays home with the kids. The husband can go the second four weeks while mom stays home with the kids and have the same class kind of close together so they can talk through it. Uh, I really hope that you guys can come and check that out. It begins September 30th, four weeks, and then four weeks. You can register on the app. If you go to the events tab in the app, you can register there. If you're anti-app, you can fill out a connect card in the seat backs. You can stop at the welcome table. Um, but I, I really hope you can come check it out. It's one of the most helpful things I've found, particularly in those times of feeling stuck. Uh, here we go to 1 Kings chapter 13. If you've ever been looking for a reason to start reading the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 13 is it. Uh, I might be dating myself here. Anybody remember the Stefan character from Saturday Night Live? You remember Stefan? That's how I feel about it. First Kings 13 has everything. It's, it's got a, it, I, I'm not necessarily willing to say it's for sure the weirdest. This is easily top three weirdest chapters in the whole Bible. It is wild what is going on in First Kings 13. If any of you have connections to the movie industry, somebody needs to make a movie or a, a TV show about First Kings chapter 13. Uh, there's, an, there's prophecy. There's divine intervention, there's murder, there's suspense, there's an unnamed mysterious man of God, there's judgment thrown down on an altar, ashes and bone pour out of stones, hands wither and freeze in place, there's miraculous healings, there's a lion that kills somebody and then just sits down by the body, and then a donkey comes and hangs out next to the lion, and if you're like, what is going on? That's what I'm saying, you guys. First Kings 13 is wild. And we're only doing 10 verses of it. You can, the whole thing for you, any Bible you, you can find, it will have the whole chapter in it. We're, we're only doing 10 verses. And maybe you're like, with all this stuff that's going on, why in the world, if this is so confusing, if it's so bizarre, why is this the one that you guys would pick to talk about in this series on the fall of the house of David? Uh, there, there's something, I think, I don't, I'm not going to be able to explain the whole thing to you. There's things that nobody understands why this is in there. A prophet at one point lies in the story. Why? And it gets somebody killed. Why would that happen? I don't really know. You can go figure it out or go read it on your own. I'm not going to be able to answer all of it for you. But there is a thread that runs through all of this. That's, it's something more than, uh, than something we have to learn. I really think it's a gift that we have to receive. And and it's incredibly good news. So here's the thread that runs through all of 1 Kings chapter 13. God keeps his promises even when you don't keep yours, even when we don't keep ours. Uh, some of you are probably here this morning feeling like because of what you did yesterday or last week, you've got to come to church and I'll do the Christian thing to make sure that God doesn't give me a flat tire at work this week. You know, you ever had that kind of transactional view with God? Uh, 1 Kings 13 shows us over and over and over in vivid detail that God keeps his promises even when we don't keep ours. Uh, in other words, this is God's story. Fundamentally, this is the story of God that we are all living. So here's how the chapter begins. Verse 1, it says, at whose command? At the, at the Lord's command. That was not very impassionate, okay? We need a little more something here. At the Lord's command... A man of God from Judah went to Bethel. Um, at the very beginning of this journey into a monarchy that the people of God went through, uh, God issued a warning. 
Um, this happens anytime people want something other than God's design. Uh, some of you are still thinking that God gives commands as a way to keep him happy. It's not. It's because God knows the best way to live. And when people say, we actually want to try something other than what you said, uh, God's like, here's what's going to happen if, if you do that. So the design, God's intention was that he would be our God, we would be his people. We would live together as a family. Some dude or some lady wasn't going to lead us. God was going to lead us. He would be a father to us, and we would be his people. And instead, that was the design. And instead, God's people said, we want a king. And God said, if you get a king, this is what kings are going to do to you. And not just to you, but to your sons, and to your daughters, and to your fields, and to your money. Chapter 13 marks a turning point in the book of Kings. Uh, this series is part of the reason that we're talking about it. This series we've called The Fall of the House of David. Uh, but I'll just tell you guys, the house has fallen. Like, we're not, we're not seeing cracks in the foundation. It's like a smoldering fire wreckage over there. The house has fallen. Uh, we looked at this last week. The kingdom has had civil war. We no longer have Israel. We now have Israel and Judah. There's 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Judah to the south with its capital city of Jerusalem. Israel to the north, the 10 tribes. Like, it's over, you guys. And so it becomes less about the collapse of this dynasty, and instead it becomes the story about this group of people called the prophets. So the kings have fallen and failed, and now we see the rise of this group called the prophets. From here on out, you'll see characters fade into the background. Specific names are gone as in, in favor of things like the man of God who rises up to say to the king and the people, remember the promises of God. Remember how he told you how to live. Look at what's happening. The prophets rise up to call people over and over back to life with God. We even start losing the names of kings, and you'll just get, a king said this. In, in our story today, two characters, you've got an unnamed man of God. And then the other character, if you keep reading past where we stopped, you'll find the old prophet. We don't get names as much as we get the hand of God moving. And this chapter begins with, at the Lord's command. All of this is transitioning to start showing us, hey, this is the story of God fundamentally. And God keeps his promises even when we don't keep ours. Notice the incredible timing here at the hand of God. The Lord sends this unnamed man of God so that he arrives, verse 1 continues, just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. They show up right at the same time. At the end of chapter 12, we learned that Jeroboam, and Jeroboam built shrines and altars all over Israel, all over the kingdom of Israel. And these weren't shrines and altars to the the God of the people of Israel. These were pagan gods. At one point, we'll read later, these were golden calves, like they worshipped in Judah, or in Egypt, rather. So we've got, again, the ten tribes to the north called Israel, two tribes to the south called Judah, a divided nation, and Jeroboam has filled this northern kingdom with pagan altars, idol worship. So shortly before this interaction, here's an example from chapter 12. There at Bethel, where this story takes place, Jeroboam offered sacrifices to the calves he had made, and he appointed priests for the pagan shrines he had made. He created these things. He said to the people, here's your gods that took you out of Egypt. So we have an idolatrous king whose heart is turned away from the Lord, and just as he's about to worship his false gods, a man comes to him. The last time... You know, the word of the Lord came to Jeroboam, and someone came to him and said, hey, God is speaking to me. It was to make Jeroboam king. So maybe he sees this man coming and starts getting excited. Oh, man, what's the good news I'm going to get this time? Maybe it's a pay raise. Maybe it's something else wonderful. But then, at the Lord's command, just as the king drew near, the man of God shouted, verse 2, oh, altar, altar. Notice he's shouting at the altar, not at Jeroboam. Weird. He's shouting at the altar. This is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense, and human bones will be burned on you. It's kind of wild. The king is coming up, and the king wasn't alone. Soldiers, servants, 
And then this crazy dude, I don't know if he was crazy, but an unnamed man of God floats in from out of the woods and starts shouting at the altar. Did you notice that he's not making any kind of warning or any kind of conditional statement? He's making announcements. It's like the start of, he's like, here, everybody sit down. Welcome to church. Here's 15 minutes of announcements. He's making declarations about what is going to happen. There's no commands, no conditions, no ifs or maybes. They're just declarations. Again, a reminder that God keeps his promises, even when people like Jeroboam don't hold up their end of the bargain. God is saying, this is what will happen. It's one-sided. It's definitive. It's confident. This is what's going to happen. And one of the things that is going to happen is the humiliation of Jeroboam. So first of all, the man of God is shouting at an altar. Can you imagine what that might be like for a king? He, he's not even looking at the king. He's standing there in all of his royal robes or whatever, and this man is shouting. Clearly Jeroboam can hear him, but he's not even looking at him. He won't even address him. And then did you notice something that might sound a little familiar? The man of God shouted, a child will be born. Maybe you've heard the phrase, unto us a child is born. A child will be born. He names the child. And he provides a name for the child in the face of a king he won't even address. And he associates this child with the line of David, the southern kingdom, Judah, not Israel. So he says to the Israel, the rebellious king, a little kid is going to be born, not in your line, Jeroboam, in the line of David. It's an announcement of the end of the divided kingdom. It's an announcement of the end of Jeroboam's reign. Eventually, a child in the line of Israel, sorry, the line of Judah, the line of David, will rise and overthrow this pagan altar. It's an announcement of the failure of Jeroboam's religion. Uh, we don't know what, what all was being sacrificed on these altars. But this man of God says, hey, pretty soon you pagan priests are going to be sacrificed on these altars. Look at the imagery here. The altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. There's nothing conditional about this. This will happen. Can you imagine what that would be like? Imagine if this table split open and ashes and bones just poured out. We would all leave the church, right? I mean, that would be so terrifying. So all of this is happening in the presence of Jeroboam, but not directed to Jeroboam. And you might imagine how somebody as powerful and impressive as him might react. He doesn't like it. Who, who is this unnamed guy? No one even, what are you even doing here? No one even knows who you are. Who are you to talk to me like this? And so when King Jeroboam, verse 4, heard the man of God, so funny, speaking against the altar at Bethel, he pointed at him and shouted, seize that man. You can see it in your mind, right? You can see the movie playing as the king starts. In my mind, Jeroboam's got a long, wrinkly finger, and he's got that long, angry finger, and he's like, get that man. So angry and offended. Jeroboam is the one who just led a rebellion against the house of David. David's line is in shambles because of the mighty Jeroboam. Who do you think you are? Someone get him. And as the soldiers rush up, Instantly, the king's hand became paralyzed in that position, and he couldn't pull it back. At the same time, a wide crack appeared in the altar, and the ashes poured out, just as the man of God had predicted in his message from the Lord. You can see this, right? You can play it out in your imagination. Have you ever been so angry, and then the anger turns immediately? Maybe like you started fussing with your spouse, but then you realized you were wrong, but then you're too spun up and angry to admit it, and so you had to find a way to hold on to, you know, you've just experienced that. The, the king is so mad, and goes from so mad to absolutely frozen and terrified. Physically, emotionally, I see the blood draining from his face. Can you think of a more dramatic way for a king to be put in his place than something like this? In front of all of the advisors, the soldiers, whoever else was there watching, the priests. In a few words, in a few moments, God denounces Jeroboam's religion, his rule, and his future. I don't know if you thought that was weird or not, but it gets so much weirder after this part. And every step in the story, it shows us that God is the one in charge God is the one running the story. He's the one running the show. He keeps his promises even when you and I do not. And this, this frees us um, to maybe be a little bit more honest about ourselves. 
here, I hope this makes some, some sense. I think a lot of us kind of envision God as a dragon who sits on a big hoard of gold. And when you disobey, we call that sin. You know, you do the dumb thing. Anybody did something dumb in the last month? No, no, no. Yeah, okay, thank you. The honest section over here. When we do something dumb, has anybody ever told you like, oh, you're stealing the glory of God? Or the reason you shouldn't be, a, you shouldn't uh, have an idol. The reason idolatry is a problem is when you worship a false idol, you sneak in and you steal some of God's gold and he gets mad. You ever heard something kind of like this? I'll just tell you, the problem with sin has nothing to do with God. One of the most distinctive doctrines of Christianity is that God doesn't need anything. He's not, he's not sitting there running. God doesn't run on worship. And it's like, you haven't worshiped hard enough today, and so he's running out of fuel, and you better worship. we got to get Justin back up here. We've got to sing a little bit more because God's running out of energy. You know, we have this idea that God needs something from us. Uh, the, do you think God needed Jeroboam to worship him? No is the correct answer. God didn't need it. If Jeroboam, the king, doesn't worship God, it's not like the universe stops running. The problem with idolatry, the problem with sin, is not what it does to God. It's what it does to you. It's, it's what it does to me. When we worship something other than God, it, it malforms us. It, it distorts us. It doesn't take away from God. It takes away from us. And so here, here's what I mean. This is super embarrassing for me, so I need you all to be, just be here with me, okay? Be lecture supportive, Nico, okay? A little lecture here. Uh, about a year ago, I started exercising, okay? Believe it or not, I started exercising uh, three times a week. And I don't know if you all ever been chubby before, or you know you've got some weight to lose. It's terrifying thinking about going and exercising. Uh, it's going to be sore and hard. And in my whole life, every time I would go exercise, there's always that super fit dude. Just take a second and think about the super fit dude. You know who I'm talking about? And he's the one that's going to spot you on the bench press. And he's the guy that's like, one more, loser. Get it up. You know, or like my whole life. At sports, anything. It was like, one more mile, one more rep, maggot. You know, and it's just, and I'll just be honest, when my doctor said, you have to start exercising, and I was like, oh, you know, what, am I, what are you going to say? Uh, so I found myself with this group of people exercising. What you need to know is that I am terrible at being uncomfortable. Um, when I get uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable, my body associates being uncomfortable with imminent death. Like, so when I get uncomfortable or something feels hard, my body's like, you are going to die. And so then I have this choice when it comes to exercising. Do I, do I stop too soon and have all of the ripped bros tell me how, what a loser I am, or do I die? You know, like, <laughs> that's the tension, that's the tension that I feel. Um, so I start exercising, which is very hard, very embarrassing for me. Um, Every time I've ever exercised in my life, the people I exercised with made me feel small and made me feel scared. And I think that's how many of us view God. I better do this Christian stuff because if I don't, God will be angry with me and he's going to yell at me and he's going to say, one more, you maggot, or whatever. Um, always been worried about a coach, a trainer, a friend being disappointed in me. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is happening more and more often. I start having this feeling once a week. It's me and three other dudes in a dude's garage. So don't get too impressed about what we're doing here, okay? Uh, I'll start feeling like I think I'm going to die, right? And I have to make the choice. Do I, do I push on towards death or do I say something? And a couple of weeks ago, I said to my trainer, Dustin, I said, Dustin, I, I think I need to stop. I don't feel right. Um, and you know what Dustin said to me? He said, totally, man, this is your workout. Very calmly, very gently, he said, this is your workout. Uh, you need to know that Dustin is totally ripped, like totally jacked. And you need to know Dustin used to look like me. Like he wasn't always the way he looks now. And he, he said, he's like, I've done my workouts. This is for you. This isn't for me. Whether you push and do one more or whether you don't, it doesn't affect me one bit. This is your workout. God says don't worship idols because what worshiping idols does to you, not what it does to God. God is way more like Dustin than the people I've worked out with before. 
God says to us, if you want this to go well, listen to what I say. Sometimes Dustin will say things like, you can do more than you think you can. Sometimes Dustin will walk over, we use kettlebells, which is fun, and he's like, I think you could do a heavier weight this time. You know, he pushes sometimes. I think God's that way. The point is, when God gives us commands and invitations, when he reminds us he's the one in charge, he's inviting us into life, which is a better, fuller, transformed life. God doesn't need a thing from you. He just wants to do some things with you and for you. Every step in this story shows that God is committed to doing what's best. It doesn't always make sense. But our choice becomes whether we want to swim with the current that is the will of God or if we want to swim against the current that is the will of God. Do we want to swim, walk, choose your mode of transportation? Do you want to walk towards life or do you want to walk away from it? From here until the end of the book of Kings, we'll see more than 300 years of history. We'll see the rise of prophets because kings keep walking away from life. Kings, the kings of Israel and Judah, are far more interested in looking like the worldly kings than the humble, gentle, tender, listening servants they were meant to be. Let me just give you one last example. After Jeroboam's hand is frozen in place, you know, he's pointing like an old witch, he cries out to the man of God, please ask the Lord, who's God? Isn't that interesting? Your God. Not my God, your God. Please ask the Lord, your God, to restore my hand again. How quickly the king turns back into a posture of humble dependence. One little frozen hand. Have you noticed how good you get at Christianity with a little pain in your life? The pain comes and all of a sudden humility makes more sense. The pain comes and dependence makes... Have you noticed how good you get at praying when you get some pain in your life? Um, have you noticed how quickly unexpected circumstances can bring us to our knees? I want to remind you that Jeroboam was on his way to commit adultery, idolatry. He asks for God's help on his way to sin. Isn't that something? And the Lord heals him. Isn't that something? A prophet came to Jeroboam and made him king in 1 Kings chapter 11. He tells Jeroboam that he will rule over Israel. This is chapter 11, verse 38. If you listen to what I tell you and follow my ways, just do what God tells you and it's all going to work out. Shortly after, what does he do? Jeroboam, on the advice of his counselors, made two gold calves. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. I mean, right away. Listen to what I say, it'll go better for you. Right, but I'm going to make these golden calves again. He tries to shout down the man of God on his way to commit adultery, idolatry. His hand freezes. He begs for healing, and he receives healing. After this, I'm telling you, it gets so much weirder after this. Uh, a series of divine intervention and miracles happens and at the end of chapter 13 even after this Jeroboam did not turn away from his evil ways even after all of this the kings were supposed to be humble gentle kind you know the fruit of the spirit peace patience love go think about those those are what the kings were supposed to be Jeroboam was decadent idolatrous and proud his refusal to listen killed him. But here's the good news for the house of David and for us, the church. God keeps his promises even when we do not. Jeroboam's failures did not keep God's promise about Josiah from coming true. Because 300 years later, from this time, some of you need to hear that, 300 years later, several lifetimes Unto us a child is born, and his name is Josiah. For hundreds of years, we hear these unnamed kings did what was not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And you can go find this in 2 Kings. Then Josiah is born, and at eight years old, the Lord says, and Josiah did what was pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. 
God promised to unify Israel. God promised to unify every nation, tribe, and tongue. And that that promise came to fruition a few hundred years after Josiah through a man named Jesus. The question is not you stopping the plan of God. You don't have to raise your hands. I know we're not in that mood right now. But some of you in this room have had that feeling because of what you did, you've thwarted the plan of God. And listen, you are just not that big a deal. You're not. You are not strong enough, smart enough, powerful enough to thwart the plan of God. It's his story, and he'll keep his promise even when you don't keep yours. The question isn't, will you stop God's plan? The question is, will you experience life with God? Or do you want to try to experience life against God? It's your workout. It's your choice. A dear, here's the one of the most haunting things someone's ever said to me. A dear friend said this to me once. I'll leave you with this. He said he's seen two things lead to change in people's life. One is pain and one is prayer. And then this guy was in his 70s when he said it to me. He looked at me and he said, and most of us don't like praying. There's your choice. There's your choice. God invites us home. He invites us near and he gives us instructions for the sake of life. We can have our ears open through prayer, through humility, curiosity, dependence, or he will open our ears through pain. It's our choice. This is our workout. Will we listen? Will we humble ourselves and turn our heart to the Lord? You can read chapter 13 and learn what happens when we let the opinions of other people override the clear instructions of God. You can see what happens. But for now, the good news is this. God keeps his promises even when we do not. If you're willing and able, stand with me and we'll pray together.